First question is, how does the principle of responsibility to protect relate to and redefine the concept of sovereignty? Responsibility to protect as a principle is actually designed to be an ally of sovereignty, uh, not a challenge to it, in that it's based on the notion of sovereign responsibility. So a state becomes stronger, more legitimate in the eyes of its people if it's able to protect its population. And if we actually think back to some of the earliest theorists of sovereignty, they too believed that sovereign power was a function of the sovereign's ability to provide protection. So it is essentially trying to help sovereign states become more effective and more legitimate by enhancing their capacity to protect. How have the recent events in the Middle East, especially in Libya and Syria, affected the R2P principle? The Middle East has been a region in which the responsibility to protect has been discussed, applied, uh, and criticized. And it has been a, a laboratory for all of those things. I think what we saw in Libya was an attempt to demonstrate how the international community could collectively try to prevent the commission of atrocity crimes. And it was one of the first instances, the first instance in fact, uh, that we saw the Security Council authorize the use of military force explicitly for civilian protection purposes. But it also raised questions about how those mandates are interpreted and what we do in the aftermath of the use of force. So the Libyan intervention really raised a lot of difficult questions for the responsibility to protect. But the Syria case is one in which the Security Council, which has a special role um, in authorizing particular actions that are part of responsibility to protect, the Council has failed to act in a timely and decisive way. Uh, it has, in a couple of instances, managed to agree on issues around humanitarian assistance, but it has not either brought an end to the conflict or protected populations from the commissions of these, of these crimes. And so it's been a really difficult case for the principal. Um, and the last question is um, about the critique that responsibility to protect often receives, as it is denounced as a concept that has no purchase outside the Western world. To what extent does um, this represent a cogent critique? There is a, a prominent critique that responsibility to protect is a, is a Western invention. If you look at its roots, that really isn't the case. It was actually the African Union in its constitutive act in 2001 that was the first regional body to effectively commit to collective action in the face of grave crimes. And it was also an African statesman, Francis Deng, the special representative on internally displaced peoples, whose concept of sovereignty as responsibility was so important to the origins of responsibility to protect. I think we can also see in the discussions of responsibility to protect in the General Assembly, in the group of friends of responsibility to protect, which is a subset of the, uh, of the General Assembly, that we have really cross-regional support uh, for the principle. Uh, and so I think the old West, non-West divide doesn't really play out with respect to this principle. That doesn't mean that there aren't uh, critiques, there aren't concerns, um, but the story is much more complex and some of the biggest supporters of the principle are actually from the developing world.